Hey guys, welcome to The Syndicate, the show where we, you know we get the world's best investors. Today we got one of them, Matthew Lebovitz. I hope, I, I, I know I'm butchering that, but we're, we're going to welcome to the program anyways. Thanks for coming today, Matthew. Thanks for having me. So you're coming in nice snowy Toronto and it's almost, it's almost May at this point? Yeah, it's, you know, it's enough already, but uh, hockey playoffs start here in Toronto tonight, so it's a big day here. <laughs> That'll do it. That'll do it. Well, I'm I'm glad you guys reached out because I know you have a little bit of an unconventional model, and I know you're super involved with the accelerator scene in Toronto. So take me through your background a little bit, 30,000 foot view, and then we'll jump into it. Sure. I, I've been working since I was 11 years old. I've always uh, been an entrepreneur and started things even back when I was a little kid. And um, uh, irrespective of my educational background, I did three very fancy-ish degrees. Um, really, I wanted to be an entrepreneur and build companies and be on the VC side, be on the buy side of tech investing. Um, so that's basically what I, when I, when I was a teenager, started tailoring my life around becoming a, a tech investor, which I didn't know what that meant when, back then, but that's what I was focused on. Um, I spent the first five years of my career at another venture capital firm here in Toronto and then uh, partnered with two other people, uh, Rob and Daniel, my current partners, to launch Plaza Ventures, uh, which was a spin out, out of Plaza Corp family office. Um, Plaza Corp is one of Canada's largest private real estate developers. He's been angel investing for over 25 years and has easily invested in well over 150 companies. Um, off the balance sheet. <clears throat> and then I joined to build out this new fund model uh, that we've been employing for the last uh, five or six years. So you always knew you wanted to be a tech investor, but you didn't <laughs> know what that meant. What exactly does that mean? <laughs> uh, well, the, the real fun backstory on it is that when I was in grade 10, which was around 1994 or 95, um, uh, National G, one of the things that for a lot of kids from my neck of the woods get is that when you have your when you get when you have your bar mitzvah, one of the common gifts, at least back then, was you would get a sort of a subscription to National Geographic, and um, which is what you did. And um, I got that as part of a bar mitzvah gift once upon a time. And one of the issues that I got around when I was 15, like I said in grade 10, was completely dedicated to clean technology, wind, solar, geothermal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I read that and I was um, completely enamored with the technology. I thought it was so cool. And I thought to myself, wow, what if I got involved in something like this? Here's a way that I could uh, be involved in something that's cool, that's going to save the planet and make money at the same time. And I thought that was just the perfect combination of what I wanted to do in life. It was sort of my aha moment of what I wanted to do. Of course, I had no idea what that meant in terms of being an investor or being in business, but that's what I started to, um, I guess, follow. That's the path I started to follow. Speaking of clean tech, there were a lot of VCs that got into the clean tech space that got hosed because it, yes. it's a long-term investment. Exactly, exactly. And of course, I didn't know what any of that meant at the time, and I'm still figuring all of that stuff out. But certainly, um, in, if, if you look at clean tech investment 1.0 in the late 90s, um, you know, most people didn't even know what clean tech was, let alone how to structure deals. And the technology was still very much at the nascent stage. Um, and they were longer term projects. They ended up being a lot more energy, uh, more uh, around energy, focus more around energy versus the technology itself. Um, and it's CapEx investment versus OpEx investment, which you see more in software companies. So, um, you know, that's that was really now things have changing quite a bit. Um, you know, you could make the argument that Tesla is a clean tech company and so many, you know, it's sort of a, a wide brush that you can paint with. But, um, you know, if you would even just look at our portfolio, um, a good chunk of them fit into that domain, even though we wouldn't necessarily express them to be directly a clean tech company for sure. Is it a little absurd that most VC funds run 10-year funds when a, a SaaS company, you can roll it up pretty quickly, a hardware company is a bit slower, a clean tech company is like Jesus Christ, and then, oh, Elon wants to get to space. Do we need to have VC funds that are proportional to the actual length? A hundred percent. And that's, you know, 
very that was similar to what my rationale was when we launched our fund was our funds are much shorter in nature uh they're four-year funds as a matter of fact uh we've already launched six or seven funds in five years um, so we do a fund every year or every call it 10 months and we only raise a fund when we have the immediate deal flow to support it uh, we invest um, actually three different strategies right now um, series A, Series B. Uh, we also launched last summer Canada's first ever direct secondary fund where we're buying out um, shares from either early angel investors or early employees and very late stage pre-IPO, pre-M&A uh, tech companies. And we are just in the process. Uh, we brought on two Israeli women uh, partners, uh, Israeli who are both incredible, successful entrepreneurs and angel investors, brought them on to be partners to run a fund dedicated to investing in growth stage Israeli tech companies that are looking to move into the North American and expand it to the North American market. And so we do much smaller funds. Um, we contribute, myself, my partners, slash Plaza Corp contributes about a third of each fund, of the proceeds of each fund on day one. So we seed the capital, uh, or we seed each fund with our own capital, and we don't charge management fees in any of our funds. Which, so the, that's, both of those are huge. I was going to say, you're not playing the let's build a bigger, 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 bigger fund because we get the bigger, bigger management fees. Correct. We do the exact opposite. We want smaller funds by design. Um, we like it that way. We it provides more transparency, more transparency and optionality for our investors. And frankly, it's much better for us. The alignment is much better for us as a result of that. And the messaging is more transparency and more alignment of interest with um, not only our portfolio companies or prospective portfolio companies, but with our investors. We only make money after our companies and investors have made money. Does the four-year time horizon make it harder? No. Uh, and well, what do you mean in terms of? In terms of, do you need liquidity after four years? Because that's pretty quick. No, we're actually typically getting uh, liquidity in shorter time frames than four years, and um, we're very upfront with our time frame horizons with our uh, companies that we're looking to invest in, and um, you know, we don't necessarily need to hunt for unicorns if, as a result of that. And that's actually, in, and again, this is, I guess, somewhat Canadian specific, because we don't have big monolithic 10-year funds, we don't need to chase two or three unicorns in order to make the economics of a fund work. We're doing great with um, smaller, but obviously substantive uh, outcomes, and it's just working really well for us. And that's much more aligned with, we find some entrepreneurs that are saying, hey, maybe it's not going to be a $10 billion company. Maybe we could sell for um, a, a much smaller price, but everyone's going to walk away and do extraordinarily well and, do, and and be very happy. There's nothing wrong with that as well, too. You can You can build a business and not every company has to be a unicorn. That's okay. How do you see exits changing since Trump essentially had the get out of jail free card, bring all your money back from Europe. Now you don't have to buy foreign companies deal. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it was kind of an interesting thing that um, uh, specifically American companies were able to re get a holiday to repatriate some capital back into the U.S. And our view is that um, if you're a large multi-billion dollar publicly traded company that has cash stashed all over the world, um, you have a few different options. A, pay tax on it, which of course they got a holiday on. B, um, uh, pay out a distribution to shareholders. Uh, which they don't mind doing from time to time, but it's not their first choice, uh, do stock buybacks and or um, uh, start accumulating assets, i.e. buying companies. And if you're the CFO of said, um, you know, multi-billion dollar publicly traded tech company, you're probably want to going to want to go on a shopping spree with that capital, but at least a good portion of it. So we're actually quite excited about um, American companies having more cash in, in their coffers. Further to that, uh, something that's also relatively new in Canada or that's exciting over that we've seen over the last couple of years um, is uh, large private equity uh, players um, um, taking a hard look and investing in and writing very, very large checks into Canadian growth stage, late stage Canadian tech companies. And that's that's a relatively new phenomenon in Canada, which is, I think, opened up a whole new avenue for liquidity in, in this country, which is pretty cool. For the rich companies south of the border, wouldn't it have the opposite effect, though, because the money was overseas? What it essentially allowed companies like Microsoft to do is buy Skype at a massive discount yeah. because they didn't have to pay that tax of getting the money back to the US. Wouldn't that yeah. hurt Canadian companies because the the money's back in the US now they can spend it on US stuff? 
we, we haven't seen that at all. We haven't seen that impacting Canadian companies. In fact, it's been the opposite. We hear, I mean, every other day, it seems I'm, I'm or at least once or twice a week, I'm hosting a friend south of the border, whether they be from big corporate or from another American VC or private equity firm. Um, we just actually hosted a dinner for 50 CEOs, uh, growth stage CEOs from across Canada on Monday night with Vista Equity Partners, um, which was pretty awesome. We had a great turnout and that was a lot of fun. So in fact, we don't, we haven't seen that at all. It's been quite the opposite. We've seen quite a, a voracious appetite for American investors um, and buyers to come to Canada now. If you had to bet your shoes on how close we are to a peak, what would you guess? Uh, <laughs> it's funny because uh, in terms of valuations, uh, we definitely some valuations that are peak uh, valuation. I'll put it to you that way. But I think if you were to speak to, um, you know, probably um, what's the old saying that if you ask a VC their opinion, they're going to, you know, you're going to get seven different opinions or something like that. If two VCs walk in a room, you're going to get 25 opinions. So, you know, you could ask any VC and I'm probably 10 out of 10 will, will always say that it's always peak valuation. But we were saying that a year ago, we were saying that three years ago, we said that five years ago. So it always seems like it's peak valuation. Um, having said that, we're happy to not invest just be, just because it's a, a hot deal or, you know, this firm invested and that firm invested. We're happy to sit on the sidelines just because if the valuation multiples are, are way too high. Again, we're a fiduciary. We have a responsibility to our shareholders and of course to ourselves. And if it's not the right deal, we're happy to sit on the sidelines. I'm, I'd rather pass. It's all well and good if everything works out. Um, but if, if things start to go downhill a little bit, that's when people start asking questions. So I'd, I'd rather err on the side of cautious. And to be fair, you're playing more for doubles and singles. So you already have things with better in general unit economics. That's correct. It's interesting. It's interesting. What industries are you most interested in and why? We're, we actually don't really look at the world from a this sector, this vertical. We're much more focused on what we refer to as the moment in time, where a company is um, really just firing on all cylinders. They understand their unit economics, their KPIs. Um, they've dealt with their, fander, their founder issues. They've hired and fired one or two different sales teams. And now this current sales team is hitting their quotas and hitting their numbers. So that's really what they're, we're looking for, where capital is a hurdle for growth. Having said all of that, one thing that I'm specifically interested on a personal level um, is really um, this, you know, if you look at the, the, the macro trends across the planet, specifically in, in Asia, Africa, um, this rapid urbanization. So urban technology or city, smart city technology in particular is something I'm, I'm quite fascinated with. And we've made a number of investments in the smart city, smart city space and have done extraordinarily well with those investments. So I would say, give or take top of my list is smart cities, IOT slash smart cities is a space I, I, I quite love. Do smart cities fan. scare you at all? The minority report aspect of China and the, I mean, the NSA and the US? The, the, the truth is we're all being, we're, we've already been, already been watched for many, many years. You know, I forget what the exact statistic is, but anyone that lives in London is on TV or is on CCTV an average of, I forget how many times a day, but in the thousands of times per day, it's already, it's already happening. And my view is that it's probably going to make my life a lot better. Um, I don't mind. I got nothing to hide. <laughs> <laughs> and um, if they can make my commute better, uh, know when I want to shop, um, know when I want to eat, know when I need this, know when I ne need that, make my house more efficient, make my apartment building more efficient. Uh, personally, I'm all in favor of it. Um, I, I do, however, recognize data is a personal commodity. Uh, and it should be treated as such. I'm very interested in ways that the individual and the uh, corporation can treat their data as and turn that into a resource, you know, like oil or trees or lumber or uh, coal or whatever that or grains data should be considered a commodity. And I'm, I'm very interested in companies in ways that are, are um, looking to commoditize, um, giving the individual the power to commoditize, commoditize their own data. I think that's, a, that's, that's really, really interesting. So what I'm trying to say is that I'm all in favor of, of um, um, taking my data and making money off of it to make my life better too. I'm, I think that's a great, very neat idea. It's a commodity, but I'd say at least today, it's much more of a liability than anything else. I think it becomes a commodity once we get the safety aspects in place. 
One hundred percent. I I couldn't agree with I couldn't agree more with that. You need you need all of the safety aspects in place. But having said all of that, you step out of your house, you're probably being watched anyway. Skiff or take. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we've got urban tech. We've got the we've got the green side of things that you were interested on uh, previously. Does the fact that you guys have the shorter fund life cycles mean that you have to be less thematic in what you're looking at? I'd say so, yeah, because we're, again, we're, we really go back to what we refer to as this moment in time, and that's really what we're looking for is companies that are in that moment in time or are about to go through that moment in time, and that's really what we like to fund. Uh, and what we've seen as a result of that that focus is uh, our com our companies our portfolios ex are, are performing extremely well. So we're not, um, you know, betting on these change the world big burn rate, go create a marketplace kind of companies versus companies that are much more milestone um, driven. They're, they're, they're much more focused on hitting uh, the next one or two or 10, you know, milestones this quarter, next quarter, this year versus, hey, let's go out there and, and change the planet. I, I don't mind those companies. And I, I think those are wonderful aspirational companies, but um, and we can invest in those kinds of companies as well. However, my proclivity is more focused on, you know, much more milestone cash flow, recurring revenue, high gross margin type companies. It doesn't it's have like, to be like a real business. Like a go, yes, correct. <laughs> I always, jo I always joke that uh, my, my uh, two favorite words in the English language back to back are cash flow followed by recurring revenue. So those are two things that I certainly look for uh, in, in businesses, absolutely. Those are absolutely where it's at. Now, in terms of where it's at, you guys are in Toronto. Talk to me about the Toronto tech scene and then Canada as a whole as it compares to other places. Yeah, so I've been, in, I've been a VC now for about a dozen years and all in Toronto. And um, I've never seen the Canadian slash Toronto market ecosystem as exciting as it is right now. Um, what it's what's happened in the last two or three or four years is we're starting to see the fruits of all of the labor and investments of the investments that were made six, seven, eight, nine, ten years ago into the ecosystem, sort of post. 2008, 2009, and yes, I'm old enough to remember where I was on September 15th, 2008, sitting in my office watching the markets crash. Um, you know, so we've been on quite a, a, a tear, the, the Toronto tech ecosystem, since really 2011, 2012 has really been on a tear. Um, there's all sorts of new seed funds that have cropped up, government incubators, accelerators, uh, you have all sorts of amazing groups, uh, things that I've been involved with, such as Creative Destruction Lab, Next Canada, Tech Stars launched here last year. It's actually remarkable. Um, another thing that's exciting is Corporate Canada, which is largely, for the most part, uh, stayed out of the venture slash early stage ecosystem is now starting to get involved. The major banks in Canada, the major other tech firms in Canada are starting to get involved in the early stage tech ecosystem. Um, we have um, an incredible startup visa program where if you're from say you know europe or africa or india or china you can get a canadian visa to go work at a tech company in like five or ten days um so we've been attracting tons of talent uh the canadian dollar um, um is at a very uh favorable rate for u.s investors compared to u.s uh, um uh, um, uh, compared to the U.S. dollar, there's you know four or five, and I'm not trying to sound like com a commercial here, but there's four or five world-class universities all within say an hour drive of where I'm sitting right now here in Toronto. Is pretty freaking Toronto. awesome. I, I lived there for six months. I gotta say, oh you did? Okay, cool. Incredibly yeah. friendly. If if you guys had better weather, you would get everyone. I agree. And uh, that's why I'm happy with our Canadian winters, because it's funny because, uh, you know, the winters kind of define who we are. And without the winters, we wouldn't be us. And um, so that's why I don't mind the winters too much. I'm used to it. I've born and raised here. Uh, but I, I mean, my humble opinion, and again, I'm not trying to sound like a commercial, but I personally believe this is the best city in the world, uh, probably by far. I love London. I love New York. I love Paris. I just got back from Tokyo. Uh, but Toronto has it all. 51% of the people who live in Toronto, and I think Toronto now has over 7 million people live in the greater Toronto area, 51% of which were born 
in another country. Think about that for a second. So um, not as in first generation, as in we're born somewhere else. And we have taken, we have used immigration as an asset uh, to really build and people to really build this phenomenal city. And people come here with a goal to make their lives better for themselves and for this family. And it's kind of a Toronto Canadian kind of vibe. I can't, you can't quite put your finger on it. There's no, there's no sort of courses that you have to go through to to make you know that to make sure that that's how you act but it just seems like everyone you bump into is here to make their life better and their and better and lives better for their family it's just an incredible ecosystem right now it's very very exciting and a ton of fun for example the collision conference um is going to be in Toronto uh, at the end of May next week, actually, or next month, pardon me. Um, so I'm pretty excited about that. There's going to, I don't know the numbers, but apparently like 40, 50,000 people in the tech industry are coming to Toronto for the conference. And it's just on and on and on and on. Um, I, I will say, having said all of that, what we don't see in Toronto, and this is still in the works, are the big tech exits. So um, it's all well and good um, to talk about the hype of the city, all of the things we do around AI and what's happening at uh, all of our research institutions here in the city, which are absolutely phenomenal things. Having, but, but we still don't have the big, big, big tech exits yet. We don't have those um, major tent poles that exist here that are the multi-billion dollar tech companies that were born and bred here in Toronto that are now you know, hiring tens of thousands of people or thousands of people. And are then people leave those companies and then go start their own companies. We don't quite have that yet. There's a few in the works that are coming, hopefully in the next three or four or five or six years within a decade, but we don't quite have those yet. And that to me is the one piece that, the one major, major piece that we're missing right now. But how, how much of that's history and how much of that is the personality of the people and the to have those massive exits, you have to be A, incredibly driven for something ridiculous, outlandish that you don't even really truly want. And you've yeah. got to be willing to crush everyone else while also having a big market. A hundred percent. And, you know, I actually wrote a blog about this sometime last year and, you know, it's well publicized, you know, Hollywood and about the American dream. Um, well, there's actually the Canadian dream, which I would say is actually probably more in line with what the American dream is or was. Um, I think the Canadian dream is really to have more of the house with the white picket fence, you know, send your kids to private school, summer camp, buy a cottage, which is obviously up north, which is a very Canadian thing. And again, going back to my point before about 51% of, of people uh, of people living in the city are immigrants from another country. Um, if you're an immigrant and you start a tech company and say you sell it for $100 million um, and you own, you know, a third of the business and you just put after tax dollars, you know, just throwing out numbers, $20 million in your pocket, that's a lot of money. I don't care who you are. $20 million is a lot of money. So that is life changing for you and your family. And even and if, if structured properly for even your great grandchildren, certainly and your great, great grandchildren can, you know, have a good start in Canada um, based on that one outcome. So perhaps the incentive isn't there for Canadians as much because a lot of people are immigrants. You don't need a billion dollar exit to do, to live a wonderful life here in Canada and to set yourself up. So I, I think that's a big part of it. However, we do have a lot of um, entrepreneurs that are going all in and want to build billion dollar companies and are, 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 you know, avid supporters of the Canadian tech ecosystem. And we'll, we'll stop at nothing, you know, to build that multi-billion dollar company. Um, they're just in the works right now. Um, we don't, we, I can't point to one or two or 10 or 20 of them right now, but I can say that there are a handful in the work, which is pretty exciting. But again, I do fall back on that notion of the Canadian dream of like, you know, enough is, what, the question is, what's enough? <laughs> and I think for a lot of Canadians, um, living that Canadian dream is, is unequivocally something one aspires to when they come to Canada. It's something, frankly, I'm very proud of. Essentially, being able to be happy with what you have. There's much exactly. more of a social. There's much more of a social safety net as well. We noticed we we were living there for six months, and we could do all of these free mommy mommy day type things that were completely free, despite not being citizens, only being tourists. And it was just very, very welcoming. I'd say that's very Canadian. <laughs> it's cool, though. Let's say you weren't an investor. What would you be doing and why? 
Uh, great question. I get this question fairly often. And the honest to God answer is I have absolutely 100% no idea. Um, what company I, did you build? Uh, I, I wouldn't. <laughs> this is all I, this is all I was aside from, um, being a husband and a father. This is, and a, and a son, this is uh, why I was put on this planet was to be sitting in this chair that I'm sitting in right now. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even know what else to do. <laughs> and so I, my, my always joke, my joke is a aside from playing, um, um, starting right defense for the Toronto Maple Leafs, this is my next dream job. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a true Canadian. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what technology are you afraid of and why? Well, you know, it's funny because I'm afraid of a, a lot of technology and not because, um, um, you know, there's these big AI robots that are going to come and invade my house and, you know, and rape and pillage everybody. Um, just I'm afraid of technology because I'm actually, and my wife makes fun of me constantly, I'm actually very tech stupid. Um, I can barely figure out how to work my television. Uh <laughs> It's so hard these days. They're getting harder, not easier. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like I have something wrong with my computer. I'm like, I have no idea how to fix this thing. I am. I can't. You know, one of my jokes as well too is that I've invested in well over a hundred software companies, but I couldn't write a line of software code if my life depended on it. So, and I'm very tech stupid. So, um, I'm not really afraid of technology in a macro sense. I'm just in a micro sense. I'm just like, how do I get my computer to work properly? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's the answer you wanted to hear, but that's what I think about when I'm afraid of technology more than anything else. What was the first investment you made and why'd you say yes? <sighs> that's an excellent question. And I'll be totally honest with you. I don't remember. You got homework. <laughs> I don't remember. I don't, I, what was the first company I invested in? I don't remember. Let me think about I can get back to you on that one. Been, been a busy guy. What was the biggest miss that you had? It was a oh, anti-portfolio. <laughs> how long do you how long do you have? Um, there's been lots. And um for 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 many different reasons. Um, um again, more in a Canadian context. Uh, certainly the big one is Shopify, uh, which most VCs in Canada definitely missed. There's a handful that did, but Shopify in the early days, Hootsuite, um, you know, in the very, very early days, I would say those are certainly two of the, uh, the bigger ones that stand out for me for sure. And if you were a kid today starting and you wanted to get into the space, how would you do it? Um, I would just tell them like, kid of what age? Let's say, let's say you're 18, you can go to college, you can join a startup, you can do whatever the hell you want. What are you gonna do and why? Yeah, I'm still a big ad advocate of going to university, going to college. Um, I know there's some people out there that say it's a waste or to start a business, you'll learn more than you know, running a company than you ever would in university. And I don't necessarily disagree with that. Uh, as I mentioned earlier on uh, in, our, in our discussion here, however, as a father of, uh, I do respect education. My wife is a is a is a, is a doctor, and we value education quite highly. Um, you know, and um, uh, going to school. There's irrespective of you know building a company is not the most important thing in the world. Not even remotely close. It's all it's it's something that one does if they so choose. It's not. It doesn't define them. Um, you know, you might run a company for, or try to build a company for one or five or 10 years, but you're still going to have the rest of your life to live. And I, I do think that getting an education is incredibly important. Um, you know, so, uh, and just, you don't have to go to school for engineering or comp sci in order to start a company or to become a VC or whatever the case may be. People come from all sorts of walks in life and I really, really respect that. So when we look at hiring, you know, certainly we look at one's resume and their education and what they're doing and all of that and it has to sort of, dare I say, check the boxes. Having said all of that, I, 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 I like to hire people for um, their brains and their hearts. Um, and that to me is way more important. And you might come from a, a, a liberal arts background, you know, and if you're the right fit and you have the right, you know, sort of, uh, there's a, there's a term in Yiddish, it's called 
Sechel, which basically just means street smart and um, or just like have a brain in your head, then that's really what I think is the most important. So whether you get that at university or you get that building a company or, you know, when you're 18 or whatever the case may be, there's no right or wrong path. However, I am a big fan of, of secondary education. I know it's expensive. Not everyone can afford it, especially in the United States. Um, however, I do think that it is very, very important. And it's probably something that you won't regret doing is going to university. Not everyone. I don't know too many people that re regretted going to university. That's for sure. And if you speak another language, go somewhere else, any other country that doesn't speak English, and it'll be exponentially cheaper and probably just as good. Exactly. <laughs> Short little hack. Uh, if, yeah. you, if you had to leave people, investors, entrepreneurs with one piece of advice, it can be a quota call to action, anything, what would it be and why before you tell them more about you and where to find you? Sure. I mean, for me, that's pretty easy. Just, you know, I, I say this to my son, my son, his name's Josh and um, he's my best buddy and uh, he's a little bit of a mini me, which is kind of awesome. And I have a saying with him and I've thought a lot about this over the last couple of years and I've been telling them ever since he was a little baby, basically. And I always say to him, and this is specifically regarded to him, and I always say, Josh, always be a gentleman. And to me, I would always just say to people out there, always be a gentleman or a gentlewoman, always be a, a gentleman or a lady, always just be kind, always um, think about um, your positioning and how you come off in the world and how you treat others. Always be a gentleman. So I would just say to people out there, you know, I know this is not, not to sound gender specific or neutral or anything, just if I could just say it in one encapsulating word, always be a gentleman. And that's what I say to my son, somewhere between one and 10 times a day, always be a gentleman. Super Canadian. If you didn't even say A once, <laughs> where is the best place for people to find you? That's, that's a myth, by the way. Canadians don't say A. That's a that's oh, a big Oh no, myth. I, we were in Toronto. <laughs> we were in Toronto, and I will say I picked up the A. I liked it quite a bit. Okay, all right. You know, whatever. We're you know, fine. <laughs> that's cool. Uh, where can people to find me? You know, I'm on LinkedIn. That's uh, easy. I'm one of those VCs that actually is very um, responsive on LinkedIn. I try to be a. a, a, a responsive as much as possible. I have thousands of contacts on LinkedIn. Um, I've, I, we invested, um, you know, a lot of my VC friends, colleagues out there, like when we talk sort of offline, like, oh, I hate LinkedIn and people reach out to me every day and I ignore them and da, 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 da. I don't believe in that one iota because I had one company reach out to me on LinkedIn I don't know, four years ago. And um, we ended up meeting and we invent, we ultimately invested in the company. And that company is doing extraordinarily well today and is might actually be one of the best investments I ever make in my entire career. It's something I'm very excited about. So you never know. So LinkedIn is a great tool. It's, it's you know, it's out there. Um, it's probably the best way to get in touch with me. It's the spam system that's occasionally a gold mine. Exactly. exactly. Awesome. Thanks for coming on today, Matthew. Hope this has been interesting and helpful for you guys. Oh, um, region of focus. Are you guys only investing Canada and Israel? Or are you also looking other places? No, nope, we're open to investing in pretty much any geography. Obviously, the Israel fund is specifically focused on Israeli tech companies, but our other funds, our secondary fund, our Series A fund are, are, are non-geographic specific. So reach out to Matthew if you've got a good company. If it's garbage, you should pass. He's he doesn't need to hear it. But if you if you got a good pitch, then reach out. Awesome. awesome. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Hopefully this has been fun. Thank you so much. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks. Bye bye.